Hey, 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 everybody. Happy Friday and welcome back to the stream. We are super psyched to be back this afternoon. We are doing a double header stream today, meaning we are live for two hours instead of just one because yesterday I had the awesome opportunity to go up to Fort Lauderdale and be on our friend Adam Sosnick's podcast with Valuetainment, the SOS cast. It was incredibly fun. Really, really exciting to join the team up there on the SOS cast. We talked OJ, we talked Diddy, we talked all kinds of stuff. We talked about my new book, which was great. I'm so grateful for the Valuetainment team being such huge fans of the work that we do here on the stream and can't wait to continue working with them in some meaningful capacity moving forward. Just in case you guys didn't get a chance to see the episode, please take the time to go do so. It's going to be awesome for you guys to check it out if you didn't get to watch yesterday. But we got a lot to unpack today. It is an exciting day for Miss Isabel and my personal life and my family because this weekend, my very sweet fiance Brock is being confirmed into the Catholic Church. So we are super excited about a fun and exciting weekend and a huge milestone in his personal life. I am his sponsor, so we're having a lot of fun doing that journey together as a couple. And his mom is in town visiting us to help support him through this incredible journey. We've got some friends coming into town too, so I'm super pumped for the weekend and just so, so grateful for everything that I'm seeing at large with how God is working through the most unexpected people and through so many different avenues in our generation. Thank you guys for praying for us and for our relationship over the last couple of years. It's been really exciting and we are officially under 80 days to wedding day, which is very stressful and really crazy, but really, really exciting all at the same time. We today on the stream are unpacking some big picture stories. First and foremost, that today is yet another day of LGBTQ plus activism called Day of No Silence. And this one's a little bit different than Trans Day of Visibility or Lesbian Day of Visibility or Gay Day of Visibility, all of the visibility days. This Day of No Silence is specifically a student movement that's trying to encourage high schoolers and college students to petition the government for a whole bunch of different things, but included among them a rewrite of Title IX to essentially erase women's sports, which is terrifying. There's a lot of politicians speaking up about day of no silence and what policies they want to be implementing in their states and around the country to protect LGBTQ plus youth, whatever the word protect is supposed to mean. We're going to be covering day of no silence on the first half of the stream. And then on the second half of the stream, we'll move into the weirdest, most tone deaf, oblivious Politico article of all time published this week. Let me just read the headline for you at the top of the show today. Anxiety and depression is spiking among young people. No one knows why. Gee, I wonder, I wonder, Politico, what could possibly be happening to lead to the greatest mental health crisis a generation has ever known. We're going to unpack all of that and more today on the stream. Flight 306 in the chat says, congrats, I'm getting married on June 29th. That's my wedding day. So very cool. And I will be thinking of you throughout the next couple of months as well. As we kick off the show today, you guys, especially if you are a first time viewer, let us know who you are and where you're watching from in our live chat. We want these streams to be as interactive as possible. So throughout the stream, if you agree with something that I say, drop it in our chat. If you disagree, please feel free to do that as well. If you have any questions throughout the show, you can put it there. But we want to get to know you, especially if you are new. So let us know who you are and where you're watching from in the chat. While you guys are doing that, I want to give a huge shout out to our amazing headline sponsor of the stream that helps to make everything we do every day possible, our friends over at Public Square. If you guys aren't familiar already with Public Square, they are America's largest and fastest growing marketplace of tens of thousands of small businesses, all of whom are pro-family, pro-freedom, 
and pro-faith. They are doing absolutely incredible things right now to revolutionize e-commerce and build a parallel economy in the United States so that you always can feel good about the businesses that you are supporting from food to eat to clothes to wear to people to help you do your taxes, which let's face it, we all need these next couple of days and anything else you can possibly imagine. And if you're a small business owner of any kind, you need to be on Public Square. So many of you guys have told me that your entire business has completely transformed by joining Public Square. So go to public, P-U-B-L-I-C, square, S-Q-U, A-R-E dot com and go check all of it out. Let's start saying hello to some people over on Instagram first. We've got Andrew watching in California. Kaleeb is watching in Kansas. So very cool. Maddie's up in Ohio. We've got Mystic watching in Jacksonville. Puerto Rico, or as Donald Trump would say, Puerto Rico is in the house with Luis. We've got Croatia, Ventura, California, Pittsburgh, Costa Rica, Indonesia, Vermont, other Puerto Ricans watching. Very exciting. Brazil, Iran. We've got Jeff watching in Kentucky, Tennessee, Morocco, Wisconsin, Alabama, Kenya, India, Missouri, Boston, Naples, Idaho, Greece. I am coming to you later this summer as part of my honeymoon, which will be fantastic. Canada, Virginia, New York, and more over on Locals. I know we've had some weird Locals issues today. I think the platform might be struggling a little bit. Hopefully the video is kicking back up. Uh, but we've got Nitty Witty in the chat. Tito is watching. We've got Alex Padrone, Magic Jeff, Magic Def, not Jeff. Wow, Isabel needs more caffeine. And more. Danny is kicking things off for us in our Getter chat over on Rumble. We've got Old Man Trucker. Luapa watching. Mark is here. My Quillwin and more over on YouTube. Total Package, G Fact, Carolyn, Art, Anto, Derek, and more. Hello to all of you and welcome back to the show on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Okay, I want to kick off by just explaining that today is yet another day of supposed LGBTQ plus activism in some capacity. And I guess that shouldn't be surprising to the average person because every day is some sort of LGBTQ plus activism. As of late, we all were watching for the insane news the last couple of weeks that on March 31st, which also happens to be Easter Sunday, it was yet again Trans Day of Visibility. And the publications that were put out from the White House in particular, or proclamations, I should say, all centered around how trans people are essentially invisible in society. I didn't realize that given the complete onslaught of marketing and job opportunities and representation in our education system and entertainment industry currently exist for the trans community, but it seems everyone is still invisible. So we must continue to use our platform for no silence for everyone. Today is yet another one of those days. It's called the day of no silence. And I guess historically this has been called the day of silence uh, and is specifically a student led movement that encouraged silent protests inside of the classroom to protest the silencing and erasure of LGBTQ plus youth in America. So this has been going on for several years now. This year, they've decided to turn this into the day of no silence instead of the day of silence on their website. They say that historically, this movement started in the mid 1990s by two college students. It has expanded to reach hundreds of thousands of students every year. Every April, students go through the school day without speaking, with being silent, which I'll be honest, I'm slightly confused about because I thought silence was violence. I don't know. Maybe silence hasn't always been violence. Somebody let me know in the chat. Fact check me on that because I'm pretty sure I've heard that before. But now they are transitioning this into no silence. Historically, though, you go through the school day without speaking, ending the day with a breaking the silence rally to bring attention to ways their schools and communities can become more inclusive. Now, in 2024, they're transforming this action day into day of no silence. So I guess this was a thing at countless high schools, colleges, even middle schools and elementary schools across the United States today. Let us know in the chat if this is happening at your school today. 
They say with more than 800 anti-LGBTQ plus bills introduced in the last year, we must rise up and take action. Just to be abundantly clear, those 800 anti-LGBTQ plus bills would include stuff like different policies passed here in the state of Florida, where I live today, to not show hardcore pornography in graphic novels to kindergartners and first graders in their school library, or maybe they are talking about policies around the country in places like Wyoming, where children can't chop off their genitals anymore, and they need to actually evaluate if gender dysphoria is a real part of their life when they're not eight or nine years old anymore. I don't know, just a thought. So it's a little disingenuous to call these things anti-LGBTQ plus bills, when in reality, they largely are centering around protecting the innocence of children. But no matter to this organization, they say the Day of No Silence is a nationally recognized student-led demonstration where LGBTQ plus students and allies all around the country and the world protest the harmful effects of harassment and discrimination of LGBTQ plus people in schools. Because this has been trending all over the country and so many different schools have vowed to participate in Day of No Silence, it's been trending on Twitter today and countless politicians, countless people of influence, content creators, influencers, etc. have made videos in support of Day of No Silence. Here's what Twitter has to say about today. They say the Day of No Silence, a nationwide student-led movement, is a vow of silence but it's not silent today. I'm a little confused to protest the silencing and erasure of LGBTQ plus youth experiences. Again, maybe I'm just missing something. So maybe I need a little extra help from you guys in the chat, but I'm not seeing a whole lot of erasure of LGBTQ plus experiences. Rather, I'm seeing an overabundance of of LGBTQ plus experiences, particularly for children in the media, in the entertainment industry, on social media, in the education system, with our politicians, etc. There is an overwhelming, universal, one-sided voice in favor of transitioning kids right now. So where the erasure is happening, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you, but apparently it warrants a nationwide day of activism. They say this day marked by a vow of silence. But again, silence is violence, but it's not violent. Forgive my youthful ignorance, but I just don't really understand what's happening here. Aims to combat the harmful effects of harassment and discrimination against LGBTQ plus people in schools. Is the discrimination of LGBTQ plus people in schools in the room with us? Because I don't know where this is happening. Primarily, that's illegal. You legally cannot discriminate against somebody based on their sexual orientation or their gender identity all across the United States already. So that is illegal. But also, the only things I'm seeing from inside of classrooms, especially all over the internet, are teachers flying the pride flag and the trans flag in their classroom, are stories of children being exposed to trans ideology at school, going by a different name at school behind their parents' back, and maybe even their parents losing custody of their children in the process. So I don't really know where the discrimination is truly happening. Rather, I think the discrimination is typically happening with students who don't want to buy into the pride narrative, the alphabet soup narrative, the LGBTQ plus LMNOP narrative. But I digress. It encourages this day everyone to stand in solidarity with the LGBTQ plus movement fostering inclusive environments where all are welcome and treated with respect, unless you are a cisgender heterosexual man or woman, because nobody can stand those people. The event observed across the country sees participation from individuals and organizations advocating for the safety and dignity of LGBTQ plus students, staff, and 
families. Across the country, this silent protest has been happening in schools throughout the day today, and very powerful people are attaching their name and reputation to a day, in their own words, not mine, dedicated to encouraging everyone to stand in solidarity with the LGBTQ plus movement, which I think anyone with half a brain knows really doesn't mean allowing somebody to live out whatever gender identity they want to live with or saying love is love or any of those things that it historically has meant. Rather, it's been twisted into this insane Trojan horse for things like minor attracted people or transitioning children. And so if you say you support the entire movement as an umbrella, that's a really hard sell for a whole lot of people because the average American today would say, yeah, look, I don't really care what you're doing in the privacy of your own home, whatever. As soon as you start coming for kids, I have a huge problem with that. But that's exactly what this protest is allegedly all about. Is this in the context of kids? So paying attention to who in positions of power societally and politically are attaching their name and reputation to this is hugely important. And there's a very familiar face from a governor's seat across the country who had a whole lot to say about it. Check this out. On this day of no silence. We call attention to the anti-LGBTQ plus bullying, harassment, and discrimination faced by members of the LGBTQ plus community in our schools. For the record, this is Governor Gretchen Whitmer. She is the governor of Michigan, and she posted this video to social media to affirm her support for the day of silence slash no silence, whatever we're calling it now. School climate surveys report that the majority of LGBTQ plus students experience harassment or feel unsafe at schools. And with efforts underway in many states to silence, shame, and stigmatize LGBTQ plus students, the day of no silence is more important than ever. Today we recommit to ending the silence, speaking up, and ensuring no one has to face hatred because of who they are, who they love, or how they identify. Unless, of course, you are a cisgender, heterosexual Christian in a monogamous relationship. <gasps> How dare you? How dare you? Our vision for Michigan is one where every person, no matter who you are or who you love, can build a great life. Trans translation, by the way, because that's not actually what she means by saying that. You'd like to believe these politicians are saying, we want to build this beautiful, utopian, wonderful society where everyone's welcome and we're so inclusive and we're so diverse and we're so welcoming and we could all just sing kumbaya around the campfire. That's not actually what she means. What she means by saying that is Michigan is going to be a safe haven for children to be taking puberty blockers, to be taking testosterone supplements or estrogen supplements, to receive mastectomies, single or double mastectomies to chop their genitals downstairs off if they're trying to transition the other way and call it top or bottom surgery because that's affirming, that's loving, that Michigan is going to actively try to protect these kids by likely, I'm speculating here, but this is the direction we're seeing across the country and world right now, Michigan wants to protect kids by taking custody away from parents who don't think their children actually have gender dysphoria. They're going to silence and shut down anybody who says that this is going too far, that it has nothing to do with protecting kids and is in fact exploiting kids. But sure, everyone's welcome. Everyone's worldview is valid. Everyone can hold hands and sing kumbaya around the campfire. Make no mistake about it. That's what Governor Whitmer is actually trying to say here. And that's why we have taken action to expand civil rights protections for the LGBTQ plus community. Like I said, custody, very real thing coming to Michigan very soon. If it's not already in question with certain cases. To all the young people struggling against these challenges, my message is simple. I see you and I've got your back. You are visible. You are not invisible to the naked eye. We see you. We see you. You are loved and you are welcome here in Michigan. Let's keep working together to break the silence and fight for visibility and equality for every Michigander. Which again, on face value, sounds great. Like, yes, any sane person would say, of course, I want to fight for equality. Of course, I want to fight for protection. Of course, I want to fight for inclusivity and love in society. Of course, I want to tell the next generation of children, you are loved. But 
I guess I'm just having a really hard time understanding how the entire world is just nodding our head and saying, yep, we love kids. Yep. We we love people unconditionally. So the only way to love you is to encourage you to be everything you are not to literally mutilate your own body, to engage in genital mutilation of children, because that's love. Because that's affirming who they really are instead of just actually affirming, particularly children, who children really are. The upside down, backwards, inverted world that we live in has never been more apparent to me than it is on the issue of children and the LGBTQ plus community. So A, this is hugely problematic because it's gaslighting a whole bunch of adults into really, really bad ideology that sounds great on its face value. It sounds great at the facade. We want inclusivity. We want love. We want acceptance. We want diversity. We want equality. These are all good things that we should be fighting for, but that's not actually what they're fighting for. But what Day of No Silence is truly doing is actually going a step further, not just to encourage the activism of adults, but to encourage and through peer pressure, essentially demand the activism of kids. As mentioned, this movement started in the 1990s, the mid 1990s, by two college students to encourage kids to show up to their college campuses and not speak for one day every April, specifically to highlight the silence that LGBTQ plus people go through. Now they're inverting that and demanding that you do speak. And it's for people of all ages in every single school environment possible and for students to lead the movement who are largely in high school and middle school, etc., rather than college campuses. So on their website for this organization, they encourage you to participate in several different ways. They say how you can participate. Number one, use your platform, share stories of other LGBTQ plus youth, share your experience. If you're a teacher, you can download free lesson plans and we'll pull up some of those examples. They say use your vote by registering to vote not just for anybody, but specifically, who are they trying to register kids across the political spectrum to vote for at an event like this or a day of activism like this? Let's be honest. And there's something else here on use your vote we're going to come back to because that's the underlying push of what this day of no silence is actually pushing for. They say use your time. You can join or host an event. You can join a club for more activism like this, or you can use your resources. You can donate money to us. You can buy merchandise from us, or you can start a fundraiser for us to make sure that we have more money to host more activism events like this and more educational resources for teachers like this as possible. As part of this day of no silence, they've created several different resources on their website that I think are important because it's not really enough. We kind of talked about this earlier this week on the stream. It's not really enough to just read the headline of something that's going on or just watch a 15 second or one minute video from the governor of Michigan and think you know everything about what this day is specifically advocating for. You really do need to go to the primary source. And most people don't take a whole lot of time to read primary sources. They don't read the extra resources on these websites. They don't read government reports. They don't read curriculum modules. But that's exactly what we do here on this stream to make sure you guys are actually aware as informed consumers of information out there with what is happening. If you go to the resources section of their website for Day of No Silence, they've created an educator advisory guide for teachers specifically working in what they call hostile school communities. So they put together this huge report, it's multiple page long, for teachers who are pro-LGBTQ and who want to teach LGBTQ ideology inside of their classroom in a school that says, mm, that might be a little much, that might be indoctrinating children in the classroom. Our parents might not be happy about that. The district might not be happy about that. They created this guide to show teachers how to covertly start doing this under the radar so as not to upset their hostile school community. Listen to this. We must rise up and take action. Here's what the event uh, of today is all about. But it, this document specifically is centered around our four support systems. Number one, supportive educators, a.k.a. teachers that are going to push LGBTQ plus ideology in the classroom. Number two, 
comprehensive policies, aka trying to change schools, school districts, and the education system's policies around teaching these ideologies to kids to make it more of a mainstream part of the curriculum. Number three, inclusive learning, aka using things like pronouns in the classroom to make sure this is a part of every single class that students take in the name of inclusion and welcome and diverse learning environments, but really just trying to mean mainstream and streamline this into the rest of the curriculum. And number four, student-led organizations, aka empowering kids to take leadership of these issues so that the teachers aren't doing this in isolation and it's much more effective to get these ideas across. When these four supports are in place, they say LGBTQ plus students experience less harassment and discrimination, do better in school and experience a better school climate. Here's how they suggest that you do this. Number one, you need to be a supportive educator. What does support look like? You may ask. It's not asking a student, hey, I see you're really struggling with your gender identity. That's a big deal. What's going on at home? Is there anything happening that's abusive or exploitative of you? How are you doing mentally? What else is going on in your life? It's saying, nah, I affirm that, kid. We're going to get you scheduled for an immediate appointment with a doctor. We're going to make sure that you are immediately put on medication and I'm going to advocate for you in that process. Maybe we'll schedule you for surgery. We'll immediately change your name and your identity and how we refer to you here at school. You can use different bathrooms at school or sleep differently on school sleepovers here at school. That's what support in this particular document looks like. They say LGBTQ plus affirming educators, including you, are a crucial support for changing outcomes for LGBTQ youth. Your presence is life changing and they say often life saving in schools, in hostile communities like the state of Florida where I live today, advancing don't say gay legislation which if you've paid attention at all in the last year, you know is not at all remotely indicative of what the supposed don't say gay bill is in Florida. It literally just means you can't talk about sex with kids at school, gay, straight, or anywhere in between. They're also in these hostile communities enforcing book bans. In other words, removing hardcore pornography from children's libraries, blocking medically necessary care for trans and non-binary people, and stripping protections for LGBTQ plus students and staff. Your commitment to education justice is critical. Here's how you do that. Sign up for this day of no silence. Connect with LGBTQ plus educators in your area. Explore professional development opportunities for LGBTQ plus inclusion. If your school is receptive, suggest our curriculum module to your school's leadership. And here's the easiest way for you to be a supportive educator in the classroom. Use gender inclusive language. Binary terms like boys and girls and ladies and gentlemen exclude many gender expansive and non-binary people. Instead, use inclusive terms like class, everyone, and esteemed guests. This idea that teachers using your pronouns or asking what your pronouns are might not seem incredibly insane on face value. It might seem like, eh, it's just a tiny thing. It's not that big of a deal. Who really cares? It is a big deal. And for those of you that watch the stream quite frequently, no, we had Chloe Cole, perhaps the most courageous, incredible young voice from within Generation Z warning about this affirming care ideology and specifically this inclusive language that's being used in schools and just how damaging it it became for her and her story in particular when Chloe was largely because of pop culture and what was the cool thing to do at the time duped into changing her gender identity and turning into a boy. One of the biggest components of that was that in states that weren't so hostile as an environment, the only way to be considered a supportive educator was that you could never, ever, ever even ask the question, are you sure? Not one of her teachers was allowed to say, are you sure you're a boy? Not one of her school counselors was allowed to ask, are you positive that you want to go through this gender transition? Her parents weren't allowed to ask in the state of California and her doctors behind closed doors 
actually said without her in the room, without her knowledge or affirmation of this statement, if you do not transition your daughter, which we are 100% sure is a real necessity, she will be dead. She will end her life through suicide. Would you rather have an alive son or a dead daughter? So when they say things in these educator modules like your presence is life changing and life saving, they're trying to convince teachers that the only way you can save a kid's life, which is a humongous emotional responsibility, is to always use their preferred pronouns, is to make sure that you avoid binary language in the classroom, creating spaces for kids to think that they might be non-binary, to push your school into LGBTQ plus curriculum modules and leadership policies at the school, and to host days like Days of No Silence in your classroom. And then they have to notch it up even further. It can't stop with inclusive language or pronouns. It actually has to incorporate what they like to call inclusive learning and how to incorporate inclusive learning for your students. How about this? Include books in your classroom featuring LGBTQ plus characters. When designing student selected research topics of historical figures, list LGBTQ plus advocates, thinkers, and artists. Take special care to include LGBTQ plus folks with different intersecting identities. When you're working on learning materials like slideshows, worksheets, word problems, etc., you need to go out of your way to incorporate inclusive images and characters in your students' learning materials. Or perhaps this, request at your school something called a rainbow library. In a federal court case called Case v. Unified School District, a federal court reversed a ban, they say, on a book featuring a same-sex romance. In Island Trees Union Fee School District v. Pico, the Supreme Court emphasized that school boards can't remove books based on their dislike of the ideas contained in those books. Remember, you can host a rainbow library in your classroom, counselor's office, or with your school's GSA if placing the collection in the main library, get this, might trigger censorship efforts. In other words, find these books that in places like Florida where I live, we're discovering are literally just hardcore pornography, like graphic novels with illustrations of how to engage in anal sex or to give oral sex, uh, even fictional stories of boys going away to summer camp and engaging in homosexual anal sex in the shower at summer camp. These have all been real books found inside of literally elementary school libraries in the state of Florida and public schools. So naturally, we're talking about, hey, that's not an age appropriate thing to be putting in an elementary school library. They're teaching teachers how to hide these books from parents to put it in their office or in the counselor's office or hide it in your classroom instead of just in the library at large so that people don't have to know that you're actually telling your kids to read this stuff. And again, is there anything inherently wrong on face value with a book that features a gay character? No, not necessarily. It's a little weird that you're encouraging kids to read these books. It's a little bizarre, but like on face value, there's nothing truly outrageous about that idea in particular. But that's not really what's happening here. What's really happening here is that these books are being used as a Trojan horse to just show kids pornography. And if you guys aren't already familiar with that, we can't really cover it on the stream, unfortunately, because it'll immediately get taken down. But take the time to go look up what books were actually banned in the state of Florida that everybody and all these teachers unions and the education system is so up in arms about the moment Governor Ron DeSantis was doing the press conference to announce that these books were being removed and he tried to show one page of these books, it was taken off the air on television because you aren't allowed to show nudity or pornography due to F FCC regulations. So if we can't show it on TV to a bunch of adults watching the news, what on God's green earth makes us think that this is safe? or beneficial, or affirming, or progressive to show to children in the classroom. And yet here we are teaching teachers how to hide these books 
from parents and still get them into the hands of children because that's more important. The well-rounded, holistic education of kids to affirm LGBTQ plus identity in youth, which is what this day of no silence is all about, is the most important thing. They also create this resource that's a whole document, multiple pages long, that is a youth program guide telling kids during this day of no silence what they can do to make a difference in their community and to highlight LGBTQ plus stories, identities, etc. in their own community. We're not going to read through this document because it's like 12 pages long, but you guys can find it on the website of the protest. What I really want us to focus on in the rest of our first hour of the show is what they're asking students to do as their number one source of activism to affirm LGBTQ plus youth in America. We covered this already before, but they want kids to use their platform, use your vote, use your time, use your resources. And I said we'd come back to this, but under use your vote, do you see what the second bullet point says? Demand changes to Title Nine. If you guys aren't from the United States, I know we have a ton of people watching from other countries. You might not know what Title IX is, uh, but Title IX is specifically the law in the United States that protects women's only spaces. It, for 50 years, has been giving women the same opportunities to play sports, to have our own spaces that men have had, uh, among many, many other things, but largely centers around female athletics in an actually equitable system where women have the same opportunities that men have. Title IX has been in question for years and years at this point with the rise of trans ideology, theology, I like to call it, because it's basically become a religion to these people at this point. And as the whole world has been grappling with the question, should we allow men to play in women's sports at whatever level, Title IX has remained the bedrock of no, we shouldn't because women deserve to have their own spaces, particularly in athletics where they can compete fairly. But if our society can't answer the question, what is a woman? If our society is pushing for men to take over women's spaces, as we have been in beauty pageants, in Woman of the Year awards, in women's positions as CEOs and as government employees, in sororities, as influencers with brand deals like Tampax and Kate Spade. (coughs) We all know who I'm talking about there. If men are allowed to take over all of these other women's spaces in the name of inclusivity and affirming their new identity, why should sports be any different? So for the last several months, the Biden administration has actually been working to institute a Title IX rule change to rewrite Title IX, essentially, not to continue protecting women and protecting women's only spaces and in particular protecting women's sports, but instead to shift that language in Title IX to incorporate gender identity rather than protection of single sex spaces on the basis of sex. This has been wildly controversial, and even many, many liberals and leftists in America, particularly those who would still call themselves actual feminists, have been losing their minds over this. If you didn't think about this from this perspective, there was an entire incredible biographical film that came out a few years ago regarding the career of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the early career of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And if you've never followed her career before she got to the Supreme Court and went a little bit wacko, RBG was like a legendary lawyer for women's rights and fighting for actual women's equality in society, for women to have the same opportunity to have a job as men, for stuff like women's sports and Title IX. These were all things that were so important. And the movie that was made about her career, which was incredible, by the way, regardless of what you think about the woman or if you think you politically agree with her or not, I highly suggest you watch it, was called On the Basis of Sex. Because for her entire career until she became a member of the Supreme Court of the United States, her goal as a progressive feminist liberal attorney was to fight for women's equality and discrimination that was happening under law on the basis of 
sex. It was this premise on the basis of sex and whether or not discrimination was happening there that allowed for something like Title IX to be written in the first place because sex discrimination was preventing women from having fair opportunities to compete in sports, was preventing women from having women's only spaces and true equality in society. But now the Biden administration under President Joe Biden is specifically seeking, it's highlighted in purple there, to dramatically alter Title IX by redefining sex discrimination to instead be treatment on the basis of gender identity, not biological sex. I... I... I'm shocked more people on the left aren't thinking about this the way that I am, because regardless of how I politically feel about somebody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is rolling over in her grave over this proposed rule change. Everything feminists and progressive leftists fought for for a very long time, for decades and decades and decades to institute actual female equality in society If this rule change were allowed to take place and were allowed to happen, in an instant, poof, would disappear. And yet leftists are championing this. Feminists are championing this. Women's rights lawyers and women's rights advocacy groups, groups like the ACLU, are championing this idea. And... Amazingly, staunch traditional conservatives are the only people fighting like hell against the rewriting of Title IX. But do you see how sneaky this is? Even when it's been wildly controversial, even when liberals, Democrats, leftists as adults are thinking, hmm. I don't think we really want to rewrite Title IX. That's a little far. Like we can we can affirm people. We can have a welcoming, inclusive society. But that's a little far. The left is getting creative. The LGBTQ plus community is getting creative. They're not asking for adults feedback on this. They're not asking for adult support on these Title IX changes or these policy shifts in America. They're asking for kids to demand, in the green box there, Title IX changes. And how do you do that? You click the link for it, and you immediately go to this page, where you're encouraged, as a part of Day of No Silence, to send a postcard to your elected officials. And they don't say rewrite Title IX, by the way. They do here. And when you click on Demand Title IX Changes, this is what it takes you to. So it's a bit more creatively nuanced. Send a postcard to your elected officials and ask them to fight for stronger protections against harassment and discrimination in schools. For every postcard sent, $1 will be donated back to us, to our company, to our organization, to create safe spaces in the K-12 education system. And the image on the postcard is very bizarre. Largely fat, androgynous looking people. Why they also have to be fat, I don't know. But what does it say? Rise up for LGBTQ plus youth. They won't tell you in this postcard that rewriting Title IX would essentially end, eliminate women's sports in America. They don't tell you that this is the least possible feminist thing that you could possibly do with your time or energy or resources. They don't tell you that you are essentially erasing women's spaces from supposedly the free society that we still live in. The only way that they can package this to make it seem appealing to kids is with a cool, pretty cartoon drawing and a statement that says rise up for LGBTQ plus youth because it's trendy and fun and cute. But make no mistake about it. If, in fact, Title IX is allowed to be rewritten, we will instantaneously wipe out women's equality from society, particularly for girls, kids, in women's sports. The House Oversight Committee recently published last December their response to the Biden administration's Title IX rule change proposal. 
And the United States House of Representatives concluded this, that the Title IX rule change specifically would deny opportunities to women. There was a hearing held in the Subcommittee on Healthcare and Financial Services last December. And here were the key takeaways from the committee. Number one, the Biden administration is seeking to drastically alter Title IX by redefining sex discrimination to include disparate treatment on the basis of gender identity. They remind us Title IX has ensured that women and girls have had access to the same academic and athletic opportunities that were afforded to men and boys for 51 years. By redefining sex discrimination, discrimination on the basis of sex, to include gender identity in regulation, the Biden administration will be eradicating, under law, female-only sports, spaces and scholarships at institutions receiving federal funding, which is essentially almost every single college and university, not to mention public high school, middle school, elementary school, etc. in the entire country. Our friend Riley Gaines had something to say about this. Under the proposed rule, women's sports aren't just for women. They're for anyone who simply says they are a woman. Let me be perfectly clear. A school that knowingly allows a male athlete to take a spot on a woman's team or allows a male athlete to take the field in a woman's game is denying a female student athletic opportunity. Period. Full stop. That is sex based discrimination and it currently violates title nine regardless of what any new proposed regulation might say so when will thomas was allowed to compete against riley Gaines at the ncaa swimming championships and take away the gold trophy the first place trophy that was in fact a violation of united states federal regulation of title nine because you are taking away from single sex spaces, from women's sports. But do you see how clever this is? If it's no longer on the basis of sex, if discrimination is no longer considered on the basis of your actual biological sex, but on your gender identity, instantaneously, women are wiped out from society. And feminists are championing this as progress and women's empowerment and women's rights and feminism. Their next takeaway was this. Number two, permitting biological males to compete in women's sports is inherently unfair to women and girls throughout the country. I could not agree with this more. And just for the record, in case you guys didn't know this or maybe you're new to the stream, uh, my educational background is in biomedical sciences. My undergrad degree is in biomedical sciences. My graduate degree is in the policy of biomedical sciences. So when you start looking at especially sports, competing in women's sports, allowing men to take the arena or the swimming pool or the track with women, you are inherently creating a biological disadvantage against women. We don't like to talk about this, but it is biological reality and why Title IX needed to exist in the first place. Men do have inherent physiological advantages over women, and we could list countless of them right now. They have a greater body size, typically greater muscle mass. They have increased lung capacity compared to women. They have larger hearts, which obviously makes a huge difference in cardiovascular based sports. They have a greater bone density than women do. So even if you put a male and a female athlete side by side who have basically a similar body size, a similar height, a similar wingspan, you still cannot account for the discrepancies in lung capacity or heart size or bone density or muscle mass that 100% impact the athletic capabilities of men versus women. I don't say that to say women are weak or women are somehow second class to men or inferior to men, but our bodies are built fundamentally differently. And the moment you put a man in a swimming pool with a bunch of women, the moment you put a man on a track to run side by side with a bunch of women, the moment you put a man in a golf tournament to hit golf balls side by side with a bunch of women or in a surfing competition or in MMA fighting or in any other sport under the sun, you have created a biological disadvantage against women. So when the Biden administration says they want to change the language of Title IX, what they're really trying to do here is endanger women in sports 
and in private spaces and to take away opportunities from women in both sports and academia. Kim Russell, who is the former head uh, of women's lacrosse at Oberlin College, an incredibly leftist, feminist, woke university, said, never in a million years did I think I would be sitting here at 56 years old fighting to get back the rights that were given to women and girls 51 years ago. And creating that biological discrepancy led Congress to its third conclusion of this hearing that allowing biomedical or sorry, bio, biological, allowing biological males to compete in women's sports can put female athletes at risk of serious injury, especially as we get closer to the Olympics and you're watching all of these sports try to determine, is it ethical? Is it safe? Is it fair for us to allow trans women, a.k.a. biological men, to compete with women? And you look at sports that are a little bit rougher around the edges, it's dangerous. It's incredibly dangerous to put women in these positions. It's damaging. It's scary. It's physically endangering. And frankly, it's life-threatening. This isn't just a how do we emotionally feel about these issues thing anymore. This is the erasure of women from society under the guise of inclusion. So I'm really curious to know what you guys think about this. Would you support the Biden administration rewriting Title IX? Do you think it's really going to be that big of a deal? How does this day of no silence in school make you feel in trying to indoctrinate the next generation of kids into pushing for a Title IX rewrite? Because that's exactly what this is. They're just using the voices of kids to say 10 million kids around the country want us to rewrite Title IX. Activism is great. Let's do it. Even though these kids don't really know what they're signing up to do. They don't, they don't really know what they're pushing for in the rewrite of these policies because they're cleverly hidden, the real agenda, behind fancy and happy-sounding phrases and activism words. So I'm dying to know your thoughts on all of this. Drop it in the chat. And while you guys are doing that, I'm curious about how you think this impacts culture at large. When we keep hiding behind the guise of feminism or the guise of inclusion and diversity, are we really serving anyone positively? And as you guys are dropping stuff in the chat about this, I want to make abundantly clear, in no way, shape, or form do I think that we should be bullying or harassing these kids in school environments. I don't think it's happening to the degree that this organization is claiming that it is, but I don't think that's ever appropriate or okay. I think there is a huge disparity in our country today between actual love and acceptance of someone and what we call love and acceptance of someone. And I'm really frustrated, to be honest with you. I'm at the end of my rope looking around at Gen Z in particular and seeing this facade of affirmation of your identity, of acceptance for who you really are, of loving you with open arms. When everything that we're pushing for is the opposite of loving and affirming and accepting someone. We need to be telling the truth to these kids that are struggling with their gender identity in particular, not screaming at them that they're stupid or indoctrinated or leftist or whiny crybabies, but speaking the truth in love, that to truly affirm who they are, they don't need to dramatically alter the chemical and physical structure of their body. That chopping off body parts in the name of affirmation is actually the opposite of affirmation. That you don't need to engage in genital mutilation to feel accepted and loved by your community. And then, in the case of people like Chloe Cole and thousands of other children like her, wake up a few years down the line and beg, ask, why did nobody stop? Why did nobody stop me? Why did nobody stop the adults pushing me in this direction. Why did nobody pause to ask, are you sure? That would be true love and actual gender care for gender identity and healthcare. 
But I'm tired of seeing these activism organizations hide behind affirmation and acceptance and inclusion and da -da -da -da, all the fancy buzzwords that make everybody feel really good. But it's causing immeasurable damage and destruction both to individuals right now and to society at large. I hope I'm not the only one feeling frustrated about this. All right, let's see what you guys think. KDG says in our Instagram chat, I think this is ridiculous. We are moving backwards instead of forwards. You know, I've, I've said it before. I said it yesterday on SOS Cast. I say it all the time. And I will keep saying it until people get the point. Typically, everything that's considered progressive in society today is actually regressive and moving our society backwards. Pawan says we should teach our children to be tough in any adverse situation instead of pampering them. That's interesting. Jeff Louder says devil's advocate. You guys wanted equal rights. Now we are all officially all one. Men are women, vice versa. Now we really are all equal. That's interesting. That's an interesting thought experiment. Sam Loria says this is an amazing example of how socialism and communism works. It is covert hostility, which means under the guise of doing something positive, the actuality hidden underneath is covert damage. Wow. That's really, really, really well said. Boron says, I just came to the chat. It's really surprising to hear this as a European. Super interested to know why it's surprising to hear this. So drop that in the chat, Boron. But Sam, that was so well said. He followed it up by saying, if the socialist communists are talking, you know they are lying and that the real agenda is hidden underneath what they are saying. It's just like the same exact pattern of behavior we're seeing with the TikTok bill. That it's under the guise of protecting you from spying communist Chinese people when in reality it's about our own government censoring and spying on you. Fascinating. All right, let's see what you guys have to say about this on locals. Nitty witty, they keep coming up with new gender identities all the time. That way they always have something to be an activist for. So it never ends. You know, this is the real big problem with progressivism at large. It's that eventually you run out of things to be an activist for. When you've accomplished what your original goal is, you run out of things to protest, to progress, to change dramatically in society. So you end up continuing to find things to protest and then you end up regressing all of the progress that you actually just made. I said earlier that Ruth Bader Ginsburg would likely be rolling over in her grave, and she likely is, over this proposed Title IX rewrite and rule change because it is the least possible feminist thing that you could possibly engage in. And yet, feminists in 2024 and beyond are fighting to essentially reinstitute sex-based discrimination in America today. But it's the same group of people that would have been vehemently fighting against this 20, 30, 40 years ago. But they had to keep progressing. They had to keep protesting. They had to keep rewriting and reconstructing and deconstructing and fighting for something. Even when you're actually fighting to undo all of the progress that you actually made. MROC says impact on culture it's simply warping the sense of reality for kids. If the message is also reinforced at home, it's very problematic. If it's not reinforced at home, it promotes isolation from family and dependency upon people who really don't love them like their family. It's tragic. This type of upside down gaslighting for kids is extremely problematic because when you're encouraging kids to think there's all these evil, bigoted people out to get me with these anti-LGBTQ bills, which is exactly what it says on the website of this day, by the way, of this day of no silence. They say there's more than 800 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced in America last year because that's also causing harmful harassment and discrimination of LGBTQ plus people, especially when you're a kid, you want to go out of your way to say, I don't want any harassment of people. I don't want any discrimination of people. Even my friends who I know who sit next to me in my high school class, I don't want them to be discriminated against or bullied or left out from society. What they're not telling you is those anti-LGBTQ plus bills are trying to protect the innocence of children. 
They're trying to protect kids from chopping their freaking genitals off. They're trying to protect kids from viewing pornography in schools or being handed a condom in fifth grade as they are in the Chicago Public Schools District or being taught by Planned Parenthood who writes most of the sex ed curriculum that not only can you come get an abortion and not tell your parents about it down the street if you find yourself in an unexpected pregnancy, but we'll also give you testosterone on the same day that you walk into our clinic and we won't tell anyone. This covert indoctrination of kids, again, under the guise of progressivism, inclusivity, a welcoming society that values diversity, is really just hijacking their brains. And trying to convince them when your parents disagree with you on this, they actually hate you. They don't really care about you. When your politicians disagree with you on this, they're not trying to protect you. They're trying to make you feel harassed and bullied and discriminated against. When the exact opposite is what's really true. And if you can convince kids on their gender that they might have been oppressively assigned the wrong gender at birth, by their doctor or some adult who actually hates them, if you can convince a kid with a penis or a little girl with a vagina that they were actually the wrong body compared to who they were supposed to be, you can convince kids of anything. And that's why this is really damaging, because you can convince them that socialism is a better system. You can convince them that an authoritarian communistic system of government will take care of them better and keep them safer. You can convince them that they shouldn't have rights to private property. You can convince them that God doesn't exist and the only religion you should really practice is worship of the government. It's a very, very slippery slope when we can twist the most basic biological realities for the next generation and convince them that they are lies. And the incredible part of all of it is that that is actually bullying kids. That emotional, ideological, thought-based manipulation and covert indoctrination tactics, that's what's actually bullying kids rather than trying to protect their innocence and just let them simply exist. I hope and pray every single day that we do not rewrite Title IX. And I personally am going to be fighting back against this. But take it upon yourself if you haven't already, especially because there are likely thousands, if not millions, of these postcards from kids urging the Biden administration and Congress to rewrite Title IX coming into Washington, D.C. today. Email, call, do whatever you can to your local representative uh, that represents your congressional district and to your senator and to the Biden administration as well. Do not rewrite Title IX. I can't believe it. And just for the record, in case you guys are curious, today's day of no silence is not a one-time only thing that happens every year. Just like trans day of visibility is not a one-time only thing that happens every year. Currently on the calendar, there are, oops, wrong picture for you guys. There are countless, countless examples of awareness weeks, awareness days, things going on for the LGBTQ plus community and their visibility. Literally almost 200 of them on our current calendar. For example, every every February 19th through the 25th is a romantic spectrum awareness week. Anybody in the chat want to try to take a stab at that one? March 21st through 25th is LGBTQIA plus health awareness week. March 31st, which we just commemorated, was Transgender Day of Visibility. April 6th, International Asexuality Day. April 13th, International Day of Pink. That's tomorrow. Good thing we have two back to back. Day Opposing Homophobia. April 14th is another day of silence. In addition to today's day of no silence, May 17th, oh, sorry, April 26th, can't forget, Lesbian Visibility Day, because it's not just enough to be visible as a trans person, you also need Lesbian Visibility Day. May 17th, International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, and Transphobia. I don't know why that's different from April 13th, International Day of Pink, but it is, it's its own day. May 19th, Agender Pride Day. Agender. 
That one's new. It's different from non-binary, but I need to go do some research as to what the difference between agender and non-binary is. May 22nd, Harvey Milk Day. May 25th, Pansexual and Panromantic Awareness Day. Of course, we know the entire month of June, every single company is going to change their logo and likely the products that they sell you to celebrate Pride Month. But even within the month of June, there are some specific days that are also parsed out. June 23rd is Stonewall Day. June 28th is International LGBTQ Plus Day. July 14th is International Non-Binary People Day. I don't understand how that's different from May 19th's Agender Pride Day, so I have some homework to do. July 16th, International Drag Day. September 16th through the 23rd, Bisexual Awareness Week. September 23rd, Celebrate Bisexuality Day. Entire month of October is LGBT History Month. October 8th, International Lesbian Day, which is different from April 26th, Lesbian Visibility Day. You are visible, but you are not international, apparently, on that day. October 11th, National Coming Out Day. October 17th through the 24th, Gender Fluid Visibility Week. October 19th, International Pronoun Day. <laughs> October 19th is also Spirit Day, which is support for LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus youth. That is different from Day of No Silence, as which is today, April 12th. Also support for LGBTQ plus youth. October 23rd through the 29th, Asexual Awareness Week. October 26th, Intersex Awareness Day. Entire month of October is Trans Awareness Month. November 5th, Trans Parent Day. I'm glad we finally have that on the calendar instead of just Father's Day or Mother's Day. We needed a non-binary, gender-fluid, asexual, aromantic person of gender non-conforming standards who birthed a child day on the calendar. November 8th, Intersex Day of Remembrance. November 13th through the 19th, Transgender Awareness Week. November 20th, Transgender Day of Remembrance. And I'm sure this very handy list put together by our amazing friends over at Libs of TikTok is not all-encompassing. So just on this list, we're talking about Three full months, the entire month of June, the entire month of October, and the entire month of November, and 10 or so odd weeks in addition to those months on the calendar for some sort of LGBTQ plus pride or awareness, not to mention a day in almost every single month on the calendar that's dedicated to these causes. So I don't really know where we are still making the logical argument that these people are still invisible or discriminated against or harassed from society. Rather, all of these visibility days seem a whole lot more interested in erasing people who aren't part of the LGBTQ plus community. Specifically, through trying to get kids to get politicians to do stuff like rewrite Title IX and reinstitute sexual discrimination, sex-based discrimination in the United States of America. I'm exhausted. I don't know if you guys are exhausted, but I'm exhausted and I personally can't keep up with all of this absolute insanity. So when I'm completely done and exhausted and wanting to unsubscribe from society from more and more news like today's day of no silence on campuses and schools across the country. I am so, so grateful for our amazing friends over at Halo. I'm super excited to be partnering with Halo as one of their partners in the content creator world. If you guys don't already know, Halo is America's largest Christian prayer app and just a few weeks ago was the number one app in the entire app store. Right now, Halo has just started a brand new series called Easter with the early church and they are unpacking some incredibly inspiring and very, very cool writings from early church fathers, uh, from people who followed Christ himself, uh, re-examining the history of early Christianity and bringing all of that back together with daily prayer. It is so good. And those of you who, are, who participated in Pray 40 throughout Lent, I think Easter with the early church is even better. If we all need a whole lot of great prayer in our lives, which let's be honest, this world that we live in is so messed up that we all do every day. You guys can get a three month free trial for all 5,000 plus prayers, meditations, podcasts, stories about saints, history lessons, and more all on Hallow right now by going to hallow.com slash Isabel. That's H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash 
Isabel and would love for you guys to check them out. We are going to segue into our second story of the stream today, which is the most ridiculous article I could have possibly imagined from Politico about Generation Z. And as we are doing that, would love for you guys, if you had any questions about the first half of the stream or anything that we just talked about, to go ahead and drop those in our stream. We would love to see you guys drop them in there. And I just freaking love you guys. You are the absolute best. All right. If you guys have any questions, we'll come back to them in our chat. But as you are dropping them in there, I wanted to spend the next 45 minutes or so of our stream focusing on this article from Politico that genuinely just made me want to bang my head with a frying pan earlier today. Uh, it turns out that the powers that be are so, so, so confused that they could not possibly be more tone deaf, oblivious, or unaware as to how upside down and broken the society we live in is based on this headline alone. Tell me if this makes you as frustrated as it makes me, because honestly, it should. Uh, but this is an article from Politico that says anxiety and depression is spiking among young people and no one knows why. No one? No one knows why. No one can possibly put their finger on why people our age might be a little bit more anxious or depressed in the 2020s than we have been before. The byline gets even better. Desperate to help record numbers of children suffering anxiety and depression, state and local governments are testing new interventions to get to the root of the crisis, even if they don't know what that is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but can we just acknowledge how completely oblivious, like truly tone deaf, out of touch, so far up their own butt members of our government and the media are by saying, yeah, everybody's miserable. Everybody's depressed. Everybody's anxious. Everybody's suicidal. But no one knows why. I just I I. Ugh. these people make me want to gouge my eyes out, okay? First of all, it's you. You are the problem. It's you. Hi, self-awareness moment. Take a look in the mirror. <laughs> There's an episode of How I Met Your Mother, one of my favorite shows uh, that has J-Lo starring as a guest, guest star in the episode, and she's an author that wrote a book. Of course, you're still single. Take a look at yourself, you dumb slut. That's, that's exactly how I feel about the government. Of course, we're all anxious, depressed, and suicidal. Take a look at yourself, you dumb asses. Thank you. It is your fault. So let's just make that abundantly clear. But the fact that they have to then gaslight everybody else through the media and write an article that literally says no one knows why. Like, seriously? How stupid are the people running our country? I genuinely, if you don't know why, it's probably you. It's you. It's you. So I thought it'd be fun for the second half of the stream today to just see why they say no one knows why we are miserable and no one knows why our society is failing young people. Uh, let's read this article together and then maybe we can make a few educated guesses as to why Gen Z is so depressed and miserable. This article is written by Daniel Payne. If anybody knows who Daniel Payne is or particularly how old he is, I would be fascinated to know. Let me know in the chat if you guys know or if somebody wants to look it up. He says state and local governments across the country are scrambling to find new strategies to slow an epidemic of kids mental illness that exploded during the pandemic. So he's self-aware enough to include that. But there's a problem, he says. No one knows what's causing the spike. I'm sorry. I'm just going to. Hello? Hello? 
Hello, hello, self-awareness, everyone. Even after the isolation and fear, COVID rot dissipated, levels of anxiety and depression remain sky high. Governments are forging ahead anyway, conducting a nationwide experiment in whatever ideas seem promising. Because we need a nationwide experiment to answer the question, why are teenagers miserable? Why are 20-somethings miserable? Why are kids miserable? I don't think it takes a nationwide experiment. That could ultimately help determine what works and save a generation. But some who treat children worry the lack of evidence to support many of the approaches threatens to waste time and money or could even make matters worse. Politico says across interviews with nearly 30 policymakers, care providers and advocates over six months, as well as responses to a Politico survey of 1,400 health professionals, the desperation driving the experiment is palpable. The commissioner of the New York City Health Department, Dr. Ashwin Vasan, says there's no way we can treat our way out of this. A lot of things are being tried and not all of it will pan out. That fact, he says, should not stop U.S. leaders from acting. If we don't act now, these are young people who are going to deal with mental health problems the rest of their lives. Gee, you don't say. Shocking. So many patients in mental health crisis, often not old enough to drive, are seemingly going to the ER that it's slowing down care for everyone. Health systems have created new facilities to handle the load, and many kids aren't receiving care at all. Politico says more than one in five high school students seriously considered suicide in 2021, according to the Centers for the Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. Uh, I actually am really not surprised to read that statistic. I'm not surprised at all that one in five, 20 percent of high school students seriously considered suicide. If you start looking at teenage girls in particular, high school girls in 2021, that statistic rose to one in three, about 33 percent of teenage girls seriously contemplated taking her own life in 2021 in the United States of America. So sadly, that really doesn't surprise me across both genders. And the health system, Politico says, is at times buckling under the load. Of the nearly 1,400 health providers who responded to Politico's questions about the state of treating mental health care, 56% of providers were dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with their ability to treat kids. Initiatives like free online therapy for all teens in a region, new K through 12 curricula on handling stress, investing in institutions that cultivate community, adding suicide hotline numbers to student IDs, and taking social media companies to court are among the straws being grasped at. I want to read that paragraph again because I think it's important and no advertisement. I just had an eye exam, so we don't need you. Thank you. I want to read this paragraph again because I think this is an important one to focus on, that this is what they think is going to solve the problem. Free online therapy for all teenagers. If you are familiar at all with Abigail Schreier, who I would consider the leading expert on gender ideology as a social contagion with teenagers, she has a brand new New York Times bestselling book out called Bad Therapy, specifically examining how the therapy industry is pushing teenagers into more mental health crises and diagnoses rather than helping to solve us. So free therapy might actually be fueling the problem rather than solving it. That was solution idea number one. Solution idea two, new K-12 curricula on handling stress. Well, as we just read in the first hour and 10 minutes of this live stream, stress and handling stress appropriately doesn't really seem to be a value of curriculum. Instead, they're trying to just shove kids into changing their gender instead, probably as one of those solutions to handle stress which I'm sure is going to solve all of our problems. Number three, investing in institutions that cultivate community. What that even means, that's the most hollow, meaningless string of words I've ever read, but okay. Number four, adding suicide hotline numbers to student IDs. Yeah, because calling the government to help you solve your problems has always been the most effective possible way at helping kids and taking social media companies to court. Number five, 
is the next solution for how we can save kids mental health. I'm sorry, why aren't we just encouraging parents not to let their kids use social media completely unhinged 24 hours a day and at night or even be on social media as a young child to begin with? I'm not exactly sure how that's the company's fault, but interesting that that's a proposed solution. The article continues, that's out of a recognition that the traditional policy solutions to treat mental illness, including training more doctors and therapists to reduce barriers to care, aren't going to work. That the current caseload would overwhelm even a well-funded health system and care providers and policymakers agree. That has left local, state and federal authorities to try new ideas to figure out what's driving the problem. Theories are plentiful. I wonder if their theories are going to match my theories as to why we are having a massive mental health crisis. Depending on the researcher, doctor, therapist, lawmaker, or business leader who's talking, the epidemic level of children and teens' mental illness is caused by loneliness, social media, the opioid-fueled destruction of families, social isolation from smartphones, climate change's existential threat, political rancor, overactive parenting, interesting, phone-induced sleep deprivation, long COVID, the decline of churches and other social institutions, bad diets, or environmental toxins. Definitive answers and therefore proven solutions are few. Interestingly, half of those I agree with. Half of them, I have no idea where on God's green earth they are so freaking oblivious because they think the opposite is happening, like overactive parenting. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the soft parenting generation that doesn't believe in any sort of boundaries for their kids that's currently raising the younger half of Gen Z and the higher end of Gen Alpha. I don't think they're very overactive in their parenting style, uh, but that's interesting. Half of these I actually do agree with, and we'll come back to them at the end of the article here, but I want you guys to see exactly what they had to say. Understanding the causes of the crisis is one of the million dollar questions, said Dr. Sunny Patel, senior advisor for children, youth and families at the federal government's Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Da -da 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 -da. This is an acute crisis. But the rush has had some who treat children worried about wasting effort on unproven theories that won't pan out or worse, may exacerbate the problem. Since 2020, over 100 state laws have been passed to address the depression, anxiety and suicide rates that policymakers feared would be exacerbated by the pandemic. Interesting that they feel emboldened enough to write that sentence now, because if they had written in 2020 in Politico that the, that the pandemic and our lockdowns and government response to the pandemic would have caused anxiety, depression and suicide rates to skyrocket, that article never would have been published. And yet here we are just a few years later where a sentence like that is a hallmark aspect, a pinnacle talking point of an article about mental health. Shocking how that works. They say seemingly nothing is off the table. Uh, like some of these ideas we've already talked about, printing suicide hotlines on student IDs, offering mental health days, teaching mindfulness in class, loosening telehealth restrictions, funding new mental health clinics for kids, etc. Local governments are getting involved too. In New York City, for example, they just released an ambitious mental health agenda that included a $12 million investment in teletherapy, Zooming with a therapist who, as we know from Abigail Schreier's incredibly interesting new book, Bad Therapy, is likely going to exacerbate the problem, not end up solving it. They then say that healthcare policymakers are in some instances pushing schools to be a new major site for mental health concerns with the aim of improving accessibility where it was lacking in the traditional system. These efforts are growing even as educators and parents are sounding the alarm about the growth of chronic absenteeism among students. They say schools are akin to what primary care functions for adults. So they're actually trying to now put more therapy and government funded mental health curriculum modules and response into public schools. What could possibly go wrong? Then they say, but it's not just schools. The internet, as much as it is often blamed for causing the crisis, is becoming another new site of care 
for kids. New York City, for example, has been enacting a slate of policies as part of its mental health plan, including free virtual therapy for every teenager under 18 in the city. The article continues with a couple more examples of what that looks like. And eventually they say, really, we don't know what's possibly going on. We have absolutely no idea. And the more this continues to go on, the more confused we are about why teenagers and kids are just so miserable. Well, gee, let's explore that for a minute. I'm curious, chat, if you feel comfortable enough sharing and you are under the age of 25, do you feel that anxiety, depression, suicide, substance abuse, loneliness, etc., has been a huge part of your life in the last several years. If you feel comfortable sharing. I, I totally feel comfortable sharing. Yeah, I, I feel a whole lot more anxious than I ever have. And I struggled with chronic anxiety for a very, very, very long time, largely because of hormonal birth control. But we can talk about that literally any other time. If you are under the age of 25, let us know in the chat if you feel like anxiety, depression, suicide, substance abuse, loneliness, etc., has been a huge problem in your life. Let's start over on Instagram. Yes, yes, in caps, absolutely. Yes, short track says yes, but only one of those. That's fine. It could be one or all. That one long says the schools are making it worse. Deer Hunton says no. Josh says, I think it's been a huge part of everyone's life, and it's really, really apparent in the youngsters these days. Somebody else, yeah, 100%, all of that, and I feel extremely introverted. There was another, yes, I'm 16, and I never thought any of it affected me, but looking back to 2020, yikes, yeah, I'm struggling. Thank you guys for your honesty and your transparency in all of this. Alex, it was for me. That's why I came back to the church. I want to come back to that. Don't let me forget to come back to that. Under the age of 25, let us know if this has impacted your life. TZ Patriot, I've had a lifetime of experience. Anybody else feel comfortable sharing? I I hear stories like this all the time. When I am on high school campuses and college campuses in particular, the number of questions I get about mental health far outweighs anything else, anything else. People asking, how do you stay hopeful? How do you stay optimistic? How do you get up and get out of bed every day? I get these questions every single day. Some parents are weighing in saying, I have two kids that age and they say yes. One person says Gen X here and I see it in my Gen Z son. Nitty Witty says what's going to happen after Gen Z to Gen Alpha is wildly concerning. Yeah, seriously. 100,000 percent. We've got somebody saying, I'm not under 25, but it has totally characterized my adult life. I believe I have had compromised coping skills for several years. Being isolated made it to where I lost the ability to make friends, says somebody in our Instagram chat. Josh says, kids are growing up in a different world. It's sad. They need guidance and they need support. They do. And so that's why I want to just unpack this here for a second. When you see a headline that looks like this, Anxiety and depression is spiking among young people. No one knows why. I think it's totally fair to be a little frustrated, to be wildly frustrated, actually, because there's a complete lack of self-awareness from the people that are pulling the levers of power in society, the people who run the media, who publish articles like this, for example, The people who run our government and create policies that make it very, very difficult to be optimistic and hopeful and happy today. The people who are driving narratives that continue to divide us and anger us and institute fear in us. It's easy to get really angry when you see articles like this. And I certainly did. I got got really, really angry when I saw this article because we do know why. We do know why anxiety and depression is completely skyrocketing for young people. So let's just play that game, shall we? Maybe it's skyrocketing because you've told an entire generation of people that they're evil and racist. 
that if you're black, you are always going to be oppressed and a victim and second class in society. And if you're white, you are always going to be a violent oppressor who needs to apologize for their white guilt and step aside to let somebody else take your opportunities in society. Maybe it's because we've literally erased the difference between men and women. And when teenage girls are going through difficult periods hormonally and physically through changes in puberty, which suck, by the way, I think it's totally fine and honest to say no one enjoys being a teenage girl. Not one of us. It was horrible. It was the worst experience of all time. And you genuinely feel like nobody else possibly understands what you're going through, even though we all feel this way at the exact same time. Maybe we're so miserable because the powers that be are trying to convince us that the only way to escape teenage girlhood is to chop our breasts off at 15 and turn into a boy before we even finish our puberty, before we become an adult. Maybe we're also miserable because Cosmopolitan Magazine is telling young women that the only way to be empowered and a feminist is to cheat on your boyfriend throughout all your early 20s. And you shouldn't feel guilty about that because that's liberating and you should be sleeping with as many people as possible. Maybe we're all miserable because Planned Parenthood writes most of the sex ed curriculum for the public school system and tells us that we should be sexually active at 10, 11, 12 years old. For the record, in Chicago public schools, you can get free condoms in your public school classroom, largely because of the efforts of groups like Planned Parenthood, and then we find ourselves in situations of unexpected pregnancies or STDs or all kinds of other sexual abuse problems and being exploited by adults. And we feel like we can't talk to anybody about it. Maybe we're frustrated and confused and anxious and depressed and miserable because our politicians keep telling us every five minutes that the world is going to implode in 12 years because of climate change and there's nothing we can do about it. But just in case there is something we can do about it, we certainly cannot want to have kids we can't have a car. We can't go to work in an office because emissions. We can't just be a normal member of society. We have to go get arrested in protesting climate change. Maybe we're absolutely devastated and hopeless and anxious and depressed and suicidal because we've strategically erased meaningful relationships from culture. That we've told multiple generations of people in a row that marriage is just a piece of paper. It means nothing. And it's never something that you should strive to. Because a committed, lifelong, monogamous relationship is going to really box you in. It's going to oppress you. It's going to make you feel beholden to somebody else who's going to take advantage of you and make you miserable. It's going to hold back your career and your friendships and your sex life. And you certainly shouldn't also want kids so we arrived at a time where we have the lowest marriage rate in American history. And we literally cannot replace our current population with the fertility and birth rate in this country. We just talked about that on the stream earlier this week. Maybe we're miserable because we're eating processed chemical crap and stem cell food grown in a laboratory that's likely chock full of carcinogens and endocrine disruptors, giving us cancer and infertility later in our life, for the record, instead of actually nutritious food. But we, if we eat actually nutritious food and we believe in the American agriculture industry, we're bad people. We're evil. We don't care about the environment. And we certainly don't care about the precious animals. And we don't care about animal rights. And we don't care about health. Because eating a Beyond Burger with 30,000 ingredients that you can't possibly even begin to pronounce is way healthier for you than just eating a steak. Maybe we're miserable because our society expects us to cheer and clap and glorify celebrities taking their clothes off, wearing mockery of religious attire like Rihanna's photo shoot this week or Lil Nas X's music videos giving Satan a lap dance or crucifying himself making fun of Jesus Christ or Demi Lovato crucifying herself on a mattress in some weird BDSM thing on the front of her album cover instead of, I don't know, actually practicing a religion and just like going to church on Sunday. Maybe we're feeling completely empty and hopeless as a society, like life is not worth living because we've lost faith, largely because the powers that be have strategically erased faith from society. 
that God isn't real, that you can't have faith in something bigger than our broken world, that the only thing you can believe in is our secular, atheistic, meaningless, subjective morality society that's telling you you're evil and bigoted and white supremacist all the time. Oh, and while we're at it on the topic of white supremacy, maybe we're depressed because every time we say that we want to exercise, Time Magazine tells us that the origins of exercise are actually in the Nazi party and in white supremacy. Not to mention, you'll be a really evil, fat phobic person who hates Lizzo if you go to the gym and try to take care of yourself. So how dare you do that? Endorphins are not for you. Legally Blonde. L. Woods would be so disappointed in our society because happy people who get endorphins don't kill their husbands, as we all remember. I could keep going example by example by example by example by example. But honestly, none of it's rocket science. Everyone knows why we're depressed and anxious and suicidal and dealing with substance abuse and miserable and hopeless. It's because we've removed meaning and hope and faith from society. It's because the radical authoritarian left is doing absolutely everything they can to hide behind a facade, to hide behind an excuse, an external image of inclusivity and diversity and progress in everything they do, when in reality, they they are covertly instituting misery division, anger, godlessness, hopelessness, consolidation of government power, censorship, indoctrination into society that is all cohesively working together to strategically make your life worse so that you will have to depend on them. It's not rocket science. A couple of days ago, we read on the stream the 45 goals of the United States Communist Party that was actually read into the congressional record over 50 years ago, 60 plus years ago, in January of 1963. If you guys didn't get a chance to watch that stream, please, please, please go back and do so because it was so eye opening. Even for me, I hadn't read the entire list, but it's things like take over the church, take over the education system, take over the entertainment industry, convince people that beauty in art and fashion and architecture doesn't matter so that people don't feel inspired or hopeful to achieve great things, consolidate government power. And make socialism and communism look appealing. These were all goals from 60 plus years ago by the authoritarian left that by all intents and purposes have been allowed to come true and thrive. So we wonder why young people are miserable and anxious and depressed and suicidal. Where should we begin? In the name of progress and inclusivity and joy and affirmation, you've convinced us to chop off our body parts and to chemically castrate ourselves. You've convinced us that we are evil, racist, bigoted, horrible people who have to atone for the sins of people 10 generations before us. And we should give up opportunities for happiness and fulfillment in our careers and our educational opportunities, etc., You've convinced us that there is no definitive difference between good and evil. So when evil manifests in society, we fail to recognize it as such. And instead, we end up applauding it. You've successfully convinced us to not believe in anything bigger than ourselves. There certainly is no such thing as God. What a childish, shallow belief to have. So we can't have faith in anything bigger than our broken world. And in the process, because we're so miserable, what's your only solution to our misery? More government regulation, more government programs, more consolidation of government power for our safety, to protect the kids. It's easy to feel hopeless and it's easy to feel like, well, even the media is saying it. Everybody's miserable. Everybody's anxious. Everybody's depressed. There is no hope for the next generation. There is no hope for the future of our country. There is no hope for the United States of America or the Western world at large. You might as well just throw in the towel now because no one knows why this is happening. No one knows why we're struggling so much and certainly no one knows how to fix it. But I beg to differ. I am seeing people try to fix it 
every single day, not by waiting for permission from those older than us or from our therapist that we're Zooming with every week for free, not by our college professors trying to get us to buy into more indoctrination, not by our favorite influencer or celebrity trying to tell us that we're horrible people. I'm watching in real time Generation Z seek meaning, seek purpose, seek truth, seek faith without anybody else's permission every single day. So my next question for you guys, chat, Alex already said this in our chat. I told you I'd come back to it. Those of you that said anxiety, depression, suicide, any of the above, etc., has been a part of your life in the last several years because of the insanity of our upside down world. What did you do specifically for your life to try to bring meaning back? Alex said in our chat, all of those things were for me a huge part of my life. That's why I came back to the church and Alex will be confirmed in the church. I think on May 1st, very, very, very soon. As a Gen Zer, what are you doing to find meaning and purpose in your life? Are you getting married? Are you having kids? Are you going to church? Are you educating yourself on all of these issues? Are you quitting your hormonal birth control? What are you doing? Because I have all the statistics to back it up. But I'd love to know anecdotally from our community even what you guys are doing so that we can continue inspiring others to do the same thing. That one says, I started a band and I started writing songs. I love that. You started creating something beautiful without anybody's permission or without waiting for somebody else to tell you everything could be okay. You just decided to do that. Who else? Who else wants to share? Christo says, I'm quitting my hormonal birth control. Love that. And I hear stories like that from people literally every single day, especially here on Instagram. You guys are very much on board with the I'm taking slow release poison and I don't want to keep poisoning myself <laughs> side of things, which I'm very excited to continue seeing. Josh says, I started focusing more on helping and developing others, learning from them and seeing from their side and their point of view. Alexis says, trust the Lord. What else can you do? I just gave it all up to God. Mad says, I found God again. I got married. I had a daughter. I got off birth control and I started focusing on my health. Marsha says, focusing on my education and hoping to educate others. Farty Marty, great, great name on here, says, I volunteered. Somebody else says, reading and studying my Bible and having faith for the future. Farham says, deepening my relationship with God. Arias says, I quit the contraceptive pill and now my mood is so much better. My doctor didn't like it, but I guess she didn't know it was toxic. Jacob, talking with people about it and similar things every chance I get, making sure we're in community with each other again. Oh, I love that. I love that. Dear Hunton, going to church. I'm getting engaged and farming, getting back to the earth. Love that. Alex, I found more hope through reading scripture and seeking social transformation, re-evangelization, and the revitalization of the church. D. Bianco, not watching the news all the time. Yes, I love that. Alex, also, I got a corgi. That also always helps. Let's be honest. That also always, always, always helps. These stories are incredible. We've got Heinz in YouTube or our YouTube chat. I'm going to school to become a pilot. I love that. I love that. Johnny, I started going back to church and I really enjoy singing at church. Aria, I read the Bible for the first time this year and now things make so much more sense. Marsha, I ditched the news as well. Lots and lots of fear mongering going on in the news right now. No interest in that. So anecdotally, Oh, I got one more. David, I'm living sober and going to daily mass, receiving Jesus in the Eucharist, frequent visits to Jesus in the Holy Sacrament and evangelizing people who have questions about the faith. Guys, like I'm literally about to start crying. These are the stories I hear every single day. And while you're hearing headlines like this and seeing them go viral on social media, everyone's depressed. Everyone's anxious. No one knows why. It's all going to keep going downhill. There is no hope. We are all doomed. In the midst of that brokenness, in the midst of that anxiety and depression and misery and suicidation and isolation from other people, amazingly, I'm seeing our generation pick ourselves up again. 
unite again in real community and solidarity and say, we don't have to stay like this. They want us to. Those older than us want us to. But we're certainly not going to stay put here. We're seeking answers to the big questions again. And frankly, we're just asking them in the first place again. We're going to church. We're reading the Bible. We're falling in love and getting married and having kids. We're deleting our dating apps. We're quitting our birth control. We're growing our own food on farms outside the city. We're going to school to become pilots. We're starting our own bands and recording albums to make music. There is hope for the future. And in case you didn't believe it just from those few stories that I just read from the chat from you guys, I say this all the time in promoting my book about our generation that's hiding over my shoulder, the end of the alphabet. Culturally, we are reclaiming traditional timeless values in the face of the hopeless emptiness of the left. 93% of our generation still wants to get married. 93%. And even when I was on the whatever podcast the other day in Santa Barbara, every single girl sitting around that table, including two OnlyFans creators, all rose our hands and said, we still want to get married someday. Every single one of them. Women are quitting birth control, which largely has contributed to young women's mental health substantially over the past several years. So universally and so substantially that the Washington Post freaked out the other day about how many young women are quitting that their only excuse was to blame it on right-wing QAnon propaganda from influencers on the internet. 62% of us have already started our own businesses because we're realizing we don't want to be wage slaves to a corporate CEO in San Francisco or New York who would rather pay for us to get an abortion out of state than a better maternity leave package. Instead, we'd rather just be CEO on day one. And those of you who are in the chat, you guys might have already started your own businesses. Those of you taking ownership for your life. We're doing research about what's in our food and we're trying really hard to eat real nutrition that we have for thousands of years as human beings instead of processed, marketed, chemical-based crap that's packaged a whole lot cuter but is actually destroying our health every single day. We're moving out of big cities We're deciding not to pursue leftist arts degrees that just make us feel more miserable all the time and instead pursuing more meaningful college majors. And maybe most importantly, above all else, we are believing in God again. At the end of 2021, less than one quarter of our generation, less than 25 percent, said even remotely that we believed in a higher power. That was it. And we were trending more atheistic at that time. Now, at the end of 2023, just a few weeks ago or a few months ago, more than one third of our generation, more than 33 percent proudly say we believe in God. We are asking questions about the history of faith. We're seeking out regular attendance at religious services. Even if you zoom into certain denominations, look at Catholicism, for example, Gen Z is the most likely generation to seek out and prefer the traditional Latin mass. Like talk about the biggest possible metaphorical middle finger to the establishment telling you you are miserable and you will stay miserable and no one knows why. The number of mass baptisms that I've seen on college campuses at places like Auburn and Georgia and the University of Alabama in the last several weeks is mind blowing. And Politico doesn't want to talk about that. They don't want to cover that Pastor Cliff, who we all love from TikTok. Go Cliff. We love to cheer you on. Had an event at Mississippi State the other day with literally like 4,000 students at it. They had to open up like three gigantic lecture halls because people were seeking God. They were seeking faith. They were seeking something bigger than our broken sexual, secular world. Alex says over 100,000 Americans a few weeks ago were welcomed into the Catholic Church, were baptized as brand new Christians during Easter weekend. And that's just one denomination of Christianity. That's just the Catholic Church. There is a revival happening in America today and a depth of purpose and hope and promise for the future, unlike anything I have ever seen, anything I have ever seen before. The media won't cover that. They can't, actually, because nobody wants to report on everything's fine. A headline of everything's fine or everything's good doesn't sell. It's not fear-mongering. It's not effective. 
this is effective, especially in scaring older people and using Gen Z as the boogeyman for all of the problems in America. But they won't tell you the reasons to have hope. So particularly if you're not a Gen Z or watching this stream, I, I can't ask you more urgently to share this message, share this stream with somebody, anybody. Because while the left is desperately trying to indoctrinate us with crap like this today, the day of no silence, to make more mental health crisis problems in our country over things like transgender ideology for kids, while the mainstream media is trying to convince our generation that we will always be anxious, we will always be depressed, we will always be miserable, and no one knows why, our generation is changing the story. We're reclaiming culture. We're shifting the pendulum back to goodness. And we're charting a course for the future for a Western civilization we can be proud to call home again. That story is not being told. But that's what I'm dedicated to getting up and reminding people of every single day through my new book about the true identity of our generation, through our stream, through all of my other content. We don't have to continue buying into the lies of the left in order to feel joyful, in order to feel happy, in order to feel fulfilled and purposeful again. In fact, we should be sprinting away from the lies of the establishment left and reconnecting with something so much bigger. And I just want you guys to know, after a long, long couple of weeks of traveling the whole country and talking with a whole lot of people who don't have faith for our generation as a part of my book tour, I'm so thankful. I'm so hopeful. I'm so grateful for every single one of you tuning into the stream every day. And those of you who just shared your stories of how you're trying really, really hard on purpose to make your own life better. That's why we do what we do. We get up every day and we tell the truth. We get up every day and we seek God. We get up every day and we tell the powers that be to shove it because we're tired of being divided all the time. And we're going to figure out ways to unify. Gosh darn it. <laughs> we're ready for a brighter future than what crap we're currently living in right now. And we can do that together every single day. Jacob says, will this video be available to watch after the stream ends? Yes. Unfortunately, it can't stay up on Instagram because for whatever reason, when you stream through the internet, Instagram won't let you keep it up uh, on your account. But it always, always, always remains up on YouTube, on Rumble, on Facebook, on Locals, on Getter. So you can always, always go find a link to it. Uh, the link is always in the bio that I have on Instagram for the most recent stream on YouTube in case you guys want to find a really easy way to find all of that. And I just want to encourage you for every single one of you who is a Gen Z or watching today. There is something so much bigger than the crap that's constantly going on in our country every day. There's something so much bigger than gender theory and critical race theory and Joe Biden's latest blunder and what you just learned in your classroom or even the crap that you often hear from people, your parents or your grandparents age about how our generation is terrible. There is God. There's faith to be had again. And there's an opportunity for all of us to link arms and to fight like hell to reclaim our country from the upside down and instead to right the ship. And if this stream inspired you to do anything about that, a little something about it, either for your own life or for everybody else, I would love to invite you to keep coming back and make sure you smash that follow or subscribe button and make sure you watch all of our streams every single day at 3 p.m. Eastern and all of our other content to remain hopeful and steadfast in the fight for truth, beauty, and goodness. Before we close out the rest of the stream today, and then I go have some fun dinner with my very sweet mother-in-law who is in town for my fiance's confirmation this weekend, I want to give a huge thank you to our last sponsor of today's stream, our amazing friends over at Rough Greens. If you guys aren't familiar with Rough Greens, they are an incredible, incredible dog nutrition company because it turns out your dog's nutrition is just as important as all of us people. And our dog's food is pretty crappy, wildly processed. And what Dr. Dennis Black, the founder of Rough Greens, likes to call dead food. I have been giving my dog Rough Greens as a supplement to her diet for the last several months. And it has made such a huge impact in 
in her energy levels, in her bone and joint health, uh, in how much she loves to run around and play, how well she sleeps at night, etc. It's super simple. You just take a tiny little scoop of rough greens. It's like a powder and you put it on top of your dog's existing food and it is chock full of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, etc. Right now, Rough Greens is giving away free jumpstart trial bags for every single one of you that wants to just give it a try with your dog's food. We are dog lovers around here and I would never, ever, ever try to sell you on something that I didn't already use for my dog. It has made a huge difference in our own life and I highly encourage you guys to check it out with their free jumpstart trial bag. You guys can go to roughgreens.com, R-U-F-F greens, G-R-E-E-N-S.com today to grab your new free trial packet. You guys, I love you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you for your prayers for my fiance and his confirmation at church this weekend. I can't wait for you guys to see some pictures of it across our social media platforms. And I hope every single one of you has the most beautiful, wonderful, hopeful weekend ever. We will see you back for the stream Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern. God bless you guys. Thank you.